اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المذنوين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة يا باب النجاة الأمة يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي أن نفوز فوزا عليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Imam Hussain عليه السلام said What is death except a bridge that traverses from trials and hardships into wide spacious gardens and continuous bounties. Would any of you hate that you would be changed from a prison into a palace? And what is for your enemies except that it will be for them changing from a palace into a prison and punishment? Verily my father related for me from the Messenger of Allah that he said, Verily this world is a prison for the believer and a paradise for the disbeliever. This is how Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he describes the death like a bridge going from a place of troubles and afflictions to a place of uh, bounties and paradise. One of the important rights, haq al-mu'min ala mu'min, the right of believer on the other believer is being there for him when he is dying. When a person is facing death, they're very scared, they're very lonely. Maybe he's unsure about his fate, what he's going to meet on the other side. We should visit them and ask forgiveness for them. Ask them to seek forgiveness. Read Quran, recite Quran for them. It's recommended to recite Surah Yasin, for example. And this visitation will ease their pain and loneliness. It will remove their sorrow. It will make them feel happy that someone remembered them and came by their bedside when they are dying. As we said, there are six Imam. He said the reward for eliminating a, the cause of a Muslim sorrow is more than the reward for praying and fasting, and this is the best way to approach Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So visiting your fellow believer has a lot of thawab, a lot of reward. Whether they are, you know, whether he is healthy or in the last moments of his life, whether he is alive or he is about to pass. Our sixth Imam Imam Sadiq. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. He says, anyone who visits his brother in faith for the sake of Allah, Allah will say, you have visited me. Therefore, your reward is upon me, and I will not be satisfied with less of your reward than Jannah. Subhanallah. This reward starts from the time that you make your intention. Not the time you are there with them, but the time you make the intention to go visit them, you start getting this reward. Imam uh, says, whenever you start to go visit your believing brother, Allah will forgive your sins. Allah will fulfill your needs in this dunya and in akhirah before you return. SubhanAllah, just by visiting each other, going to each other's houses, going out for coffee, going out for lunch. Imam Ali alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. He said, a friend can't be considered as a true friend unless he is tested on three occasions. One, at the time of need. The second one, behind your back. And the third one is after your death. And we see that one way to be there for our brother after their death is to attend their janazah, go to their funeral, 
the brother was telling me here that someone recently passed away and they went to their funeral and did their janazah. Inshallah, Allah will grant him jannah. This is one of the rights of Muslim over other Muslim. We see that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. Muhammad. He said, Ya Ali, Jibra'il wished to become a human being for seven things. One of those things we mentioned the other night, but I'll mention all of them tonight, inshallah. One is Salatul Jama'ah, congregational prayer. Two, companionship with scholars, establishing peace between two people, honoring the orphans, visiting the sick, and attending the funeral processions. And the last is giving water to the pilgrims. So there's such a high reward for these things. Jibra'il wants to come down here and be human to get the reward for attending janazah of a mu'min, of a balipa. Our fifth imam, he said, the one who follows the funeral procession, he's following the tabut, the coffin, he will be given four intercessions on the day of resurrection. And whatever he prays for that deceased brother, the mayor, whatever he prays for him, then Allah will tell the angel to say, the same is for you. We ask for forgiveness for that person, the angel says, forgiveness is for you. We pray for Jannah for that person, angel say, Jannah is for you. In another narration, it said, the first gift that a believer will give after his death is that those who follow his funeral procession, they are forgiven. Even after death, he is giving us a gift. When you follow that procession, Allah gives you forgiveness. Losing a loved one is very difficult. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the deceased, you know, grant them high place in Jannah. We pray for all the mu'mineen and mu'minat. When we have someone who loses their family member, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them patience, to give them sabr. We should remember that Life is short. Death will come to us unexpectedly. Inshallah. And we have to remember when we're standing at that grave, I'm always remembering when they're doing tawqeen, telling that person that true, their true beliefs, one day I will also be in the same place. Inshallah. We have to remember this. Allah says, Kullu nafsan Every soul will taste death. And you will only be given your full compensation on the day of resurrection. So he who is drawn away from the fire and admitted to Jannah has attained his desire. And what is the life of this world except the enjoyment of delusion? We should be like those people in the airport. Have you ever seen the people in the airport? They're connecting from one flight to the other flight and they are running around like they are, they are there but they are not there. Their mind is somewhere else and they're looking right and left all around trying to find the time do I have time? Can I make my trip? Can I get to my destination? We should be like this, but in a similar manner, you know? We should be concerned about our author. We have, because the narration say that we're in this world like a traveler. The traveler is not here long. He's not focused on being in one place too long. He's focused on getting to his destination. So we have to keep in mind that in the Dahi, when they arrive your own, barely we are from Allah, and to him is the return. We don't want to be idle, think that we have all of the time in the world. You know, we lengthen our hopes, think that we will be here forever. So we should start doing the things that we need to do. We have to make, you know, be careful not to miss our path to Jannah. We don't want to miss our trip. We have to get our priorities in order before death sneaks up to us while we're unaware. We should be prepared for that moment to the best of our ability. We see if that if someone is prepared for their death and they know what is awaiting them, like the companions of Imam Hussein, they will embrace death when it comes to them. They say about one of the Sahaba, uh, Buwer, embraced death when it came to him and he actually smiled when he went out into the battlefield. Because he knew that defending Imam Hussein alayhi salam, what tawab was waiting for him, what reward was waiting for him, and he knew that he was fulfilling his purpose. So he smiled when he went out to face death. Imam Ali alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Muhammad. He said, every 
every breath that you take is a step towards your death. If man perceived his death and the speed that it is racing towards him, he would detest this world and every single thing in it. One is seeking death, one is seeking this world by death is seeking him. The thing that makes us seek uh, this dunya and not the and not think about our death is hope of dunya. Like they say, Allahumma uqraj hope of dunya min kalbi. May uh, oh Allah remove the love of this dunya from my heart. It's good dua. No one can escape death. As we said, kulu uh, kulu nafsin da'atul maut. And I'll use a story for akhlaqi purpose. It's mentioned in Sunni narrations. It says uh, about a man from Bani Israel. He used to sit with Nabi uh, Suleiman alayhi salam. And during one of these sessions, Malakul Maut entered this gathering. Upon seeing the angel, the man's face became yellow, became pale. He got scared. He said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, I'm afraid of this person. So, you know, order the wind. Suleiman had control of the wind. He said, Order the wind to take me to India. Uh, you know, he's thinking the farthest place away is take me to India. So, Nabi Suleiman, he told the wind to take him to India. So, shortly after, Malakum Al approached Suleiman and gave him salam. Prophet Suleiman, you know, um, he asked the angel, why do you look so surprised, so amazed? Malakum Al, he replied that he had been ordered to take a soul of a young man that was in Prophet Suleiman's gathering. But, Allah told him to take his soul in India. And he's wondering, he is here. I have to take his soul today. How am I going to take his soul all the way in India? So, we see that uh, he, when, Nabi, when this guy saw the angel of death, what did he do? He was afraid. He wanted to run away from the angel of death. So, the moral of the story is that we should prepare for death. We shouldn't be scared when we see death, and we shouldn't want to run away from it. If we are prepared, we will be em embracing and giving salam to Malakul Maut, for example. Imam Ali alayhi salam. salli ala Muhammad Muhammad. Giving some advice to Imam Hassan alayhi salam. He says, Oh my child, know that you have been created for the next world, not for this dunya. You are for destruction in this world, not for lasting, for dying, not for living. You are in a place that doesn't belong to you, a house for making preparations, a passage towards the next world. You are being chased by death from which the one who runs away, he can never escape from it. It would surely overtake him. So be on guard against it, lest it overtakes you at a time that you are in a sinful state. You are thinking of repenting and it creates obstruction between you and repentance. In that case, you will ruin yourself. Only giving this advice to the son, but it's for all of us. We have to be prepared. We have to look at how we are living our life every day. Is it a life that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be pleased with? Would it be a life that we would be pleased with if angel of death came you know, to take us at any moment? Would we feel satisfied with the way we are living? You know, the thought of this just alone would be a great deterrent from the greater sins. As soon as we think of this, we would leave everything. But the problem is we are forgetting most of the time. We have to keep these thoughts in our mind. Imam's advice continues. He said, Oh my child, remember death very much, and the place that you have to go suddenly, and will reach after death, so that when it comes to you, you are already on guard against it. You have prepared yourself for it, and it doesn't come to you all of a sudden and surprise you. We should prepare. I remember there was this uh, one brother in South Carolina in a prison a long time ago. I was a teenager, and this guy, he, you know, he was practicing Islam and practicing Islam, and then all of a sudden he stopped. He didn't come to Salat. He didn't come to. Juma, he, he was in a different dormitory, but he, ne he never came. He stopped coming. And you notice if uh, someone in the community, they're not there, you wonder what's going on with them, let's check on them. Then we heard, okay, brother is not praying, brother is not doing anything, he is keeping away from the Muslims. You know? So, me and
and some other brothers were working in the cafeteria. So we said when he his turn comes in for that dorm, we're gonna go talk to him and you know try to counsel him. So he came in. It was on a Thursday. So Juma is uh, you know the next day, or it was either like Friday morning. It was before the Juma, and we told him you know seek forgiveness of Allah. It's not too late. You know come back. We we'll welcome you. We want you to be here. You know all of these things, and you know just. Do the right thing. Remember, you know, your duty to Allah. We we are here for you. We are our family. So then we went to the Jum'ah prayer. And unfortunately, we didn't see the brother, you know. So when we went back to the dorms, we found out that during the daily check, they come around and count everybody in their room. Make sure no one left. The knocking on the door, people need to stand up. They knocked on the door. The guy didn't stand up. Knock on the door. He didn't stand up. You can't sleep during this time, you'll get in trouble. So they open the door and they find out that he passed away, you know. So we have many chances, you know, in front of us to do the right thing. But oftentimes we ignore the call to do good, thinking that we have more time. But we don't know, maybe that is our last chance. We called him back to Islam, he could have came, but he said, I don't want it. And he didn't know that's going to be the last time he lays down. You know, we would hate for Allah to take our soul while we are in a state of rebellion or a state of disobedience. So we should remember this all the time in our daily life. Salli ala Muhammad. Muhammad. It's narrated that one of the Ansar, he asked for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salli ala Muhammad. He said, why is it that I don't like death? Prophet asked him, do you have any money? He said, yes, you know, he was wealthy. Prophet said, send some of your wealth, send it ahead of yourself. One who one is always attached to their wealth and their belongings. So if he sends it ahead of himself, then he wants to join it. But if he keeps it, then he wants to stay here with it. You know, death is difficult. So we have to remember you know, all our loved ones who passed away. Don't forget them. Always pray for them. Well, I was saying this dua, Rabbana Shalala wa Lakwana and Nadina Sabakuna bil Iman. Oh, our Lord, forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith. There's a very interesting narration by uh, Sheikh Al Kumi that um, during the last moments of his life, Salman went to one of the graveyards and he spoke to a dead person. So Salman is awliya Allah. He's the one that said if Abu Dhar knew what was in the mind of Salman, he would go crazy. He would lose his mind. And when we look at Abu Dhar, he has the zuhud or asceticism of Nabi Isa. So if he knows what is in his mind, he will go crazy. And this is just some small thing about Salman. So the dead person was narrating to Salman what happened to him after his death. He says, when they finished praying on me, I was carried to my grave and I was put inside of it. I faced a great terror. O Salman, know well that when I was put down into the coffin, from the coffin into the grave, I felt that I fell from the sky all the way down to the grave. Then my grave was sealed with bricks and they covered, the, covered it with earth and the caller called everyone to leave. You know, the feeling of falling down is very scary. Imagine falling from the roof, how we would feel for three, four stories. It's very terrifying. You know, what is the fear of falling, he says, from the sky all the way down to the earth? You know, everyone leaves. He said, the caller told everyone to leave. Everyone leaves the person after a while. How long will the loved one stay there by the deceased? You know, the closest person stays a few minutes only, and then they leave. Quran says, and you have certainly come to us alone, and we have as you we as we have created you the first time. Narration continues. He said, after the caller called everyone to leave, I started having regrets. I cried because of the grave's narrowness and the pressure of the grave. I said, I wish I could come back. If I could come back, I would do good things. Then he heard a voice from the grave answering him, No. It is but a word that he speaks, and behind them is a barrier, a barzakh, until the day they are raised. I said, who is this speaking to me? Who is reciting this verse? It's what the dead man says. 
And he answered, he said, I am an angel that Allah has authorized over all of his creatures to make them write their own deeds. It's us who will write our book of deeds. On the day of judgment, we will bring that book with us. All our confessions will be in that book. He said, then he pulled me and he forced me to sit down. He told me, write your deeds. How many volumes he has to write? You know, one million, hundred million, one billion volumes of all his deeds. So he told him, I can't calculate all my deeds. I don't know what I did. You know, for me sometimes I don't know what I did yesterday. And he's talking about from all of my existence, tell me what you did, you're going to write it down. He said, I don't remember everything. The angel told him, having you heard your Lord's words, Allah has kept count of it, but they have forgotten it. Then he told me to write it, and I'll dictate it to you. Then he dictated to me everything I did in this dunya until there was nothing left, big or small. There's another narration goes with this, and he says, and he writes the good deeds that he did in this life until he reaches his bad deeds. When he reaches his bad deeds, he feels ashamed. He says, I, I cannot write it. You know, that look at that non-mahram woman that I did, how can I write that? The lie that I told someone, how can I write it? The ghibah that I have done, how can I write this? He gets ashamed. The angel says, oh sinner, now you are ashamed. You weren't ashamed before, your, before in front of your creator when you did these things. You know, for example, in this dunya, if a child is watching us, we'll be very careful and we won't commit some of the actions because we are ashamed to do those things in front of a small child. But yet, we are not ashamed to do them in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be said, weren't you ashamed in front of Allah? And now you are ashamed before me, the angel is saying. You know, he will say, right, this issue of being ashamed before Allah, before the angels, before people, you know, is so great that it would be as if, you know, you don't want anyone to know those things that you did in this dunya, the mistakes you did, the sins you did. You would wish that the earth would just swallow you and be done with it. So no one would find out some of the things. Rasulullah Muhammad. He said, remember death often. This will save you for longing for the worldly pleasures. And our fourth Imam, he said, O oh people, fear Allah and know that you will inevitably return to Him. When everyone will see His good and bad deeds right before His eyes, He will wish for the longest period of time to separate Himself from His bad deeds. He says, Allah warns you about Himself. Woe to you, O son of Adam. You are negligent but not neglected. Your death is rushing towards you. It is approaching you with sure steps. It is targeting you and is about to hit you. Imam is saying the death is like the arrow is coming at us. It's about to hit us, but we don't know. The angel of death will seize your soul and you will be alone in your grave. Therefore, your soul will be given back to you, and the two angels, Munkar and Nakir, will break into your grave to interrogate you difficultly. Firstly, they will ask you about your Lord, who you are worshipping, your prophet who was sent to you, the religion you are following, the book you are reciting, the Imam who you accepted and followed. They will ask you how you spent your years, how you spent your money, and the ways that you spent this. Be cautious, look upon yourself and prepare the answers for the test, the examination and the interrogation. You know, in this dunya, we are preparing for tests all the time. We are preparing for exams. Those in university, they are spending a lot of time, all-nighters they call them, preparing for this test. All those who went to university, they know you are staying up all night preparing for this test and examination. In our jobs, we are preparing for test, examination, to get promotion. But what about preparing ourselves for the biggest test of all? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَحَيَا لَيَبْلُوَاكُمْ أَيْلِكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْكَفُورِ He created this life and death to test you, to see which is in the best, uh, who is, has the best of deeds. He is the Almighty, the most forgiving. We have to prepare for this test. This is the greatest test. Prepare for this test more than you prepare for any other test or exam. Because our belief, our actions, they will all be tested. So we have to strive 
our, to the best of our abilities to implement the things that we learn and the teachings of those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent here to guide us, which is Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Allah, 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 Allah. The tradition of fourth Imam continues, If you are faithful, knowledgeable of your religion, loyal to the truthful, and following Allah's disciples, Allah will prompt you to provide an acceptable confirmation and will make you speak accurately. Allah will aid you in your speech. Even if you are afraid, Allah will aid you. So that you will say the correct answer and you will be and you will be told of gaining paradise and Allah's consent, and the angels will receive you with comfort and happiness. However, if you are not, your tongue will stammer, you will start stuttering, your proof will be rejected, you will be unable to answer. Hell will be brought towards you, and the angels will receive you with anguish of the boiling water of hellfire. There's a story once of this young man who was on his deathbed. And the Prophet came and sat near him. He told him, recite Shahada thing. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We've been saying our whole life, it should be easy for us to say, but he couldn't say it. He couldn't say anything. So the Prophet asked if his mother was there. She, there was a woman there. She said, yes, I'm his mother. She said, are you happy with him? He said, you know, we haven't really been on good terms. We haven't spoken in many years. So the prophet asked the woman to forgive her son. So she forgave him, and then the young man was able to recite his shahadatain. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So he said, what do you see at this moment? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I see someone is very scary looking. You know, he is coming towards me and he has got a hold of me and he's not leaving me alone. Then the Prophet taught him a dua. Prophet said, you know, recite this dua. He said, what do you see? He said, I see a handsome and fragrant man. He's moving towards me. Prophet said, keep reading this dua. When the youth repeated his dua, he said, Ya Rasulullah, both of them have disappeared from my sight. In the face of the Prophet, he began to smile, and he said, Oh Allah, forgive the sins of this young man. And then he passed away. Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he says, If you could only see what happens during and after death, you would give up all hopes of this dunya and all the tricky attractions that it has. You know, we should want to stay in this dunya in order to use it as a place to receive rewards in the next life. Like a farmer, he is planting a seed. We should always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a good ending. Because this is the most important thing, to have a good ending. You know, how many see people we see in this dunya that started out good, but they ended bad? For example, Shemr, the one who killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He used to be a Quran reciter. He fought alongside of Amir al in the Battle of Safin, supporting Imam. And then later, look at his ending. He is beheading the grandson of the Prophet. And then often we see people who start out bad, but they are ending good. Look at Hurra bin Yazid al -Rahi. He's holding Imam Hussein in that place. But in the end, he sought forgiveness and ended well and died on the battlefield supporting Imam Hussein She said in her dua, Ya Allah, by your knowledge of the unseen and your power over creation, keep me alive so long as you know that life is good for me, and cause me to die when you know that death is good for me. She put it all in the hands of Allah. And our first Imam, he said, Beware, you have been ordered insistently to march and be gui and been guided out to provide for the journey. We have all the instructions for this journey. Surely the most frightening thing which I am afraid about you is to follow desires and to widen the hopes. So now, surely this world has turned its back and announced its departure, while the next world has appeared forward and proclaimed its approach. Today is the day of preparation, while tomorrow is the day of grace. The place to proceed is to Jannah, while the place of doom is Jahannam. Surely you are in the days of hopes, behind which stands the hastening death. 
Whoever acts during the days of hope before the approach of death, his action will benefit him in this world and the next. Death will not harm him. But he who fails to act during the period of hope before the approach of death, his action is a loss, and his death will be harmful to him. When we think about our loved ones who passed away, there are many things that we can do for them to help them after their death. We can recite Surah Al-Fatiha, for example. We can read Quran for them. We can recite Dua for them. We can perform Ziyarat for them. We can do Umrah for them, for example, on their behalf. We can give Sadaqah on their behalf. We can make Majlis, serve food on their behalf. The reward of these things will be given them, you know, they will get them by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was once talking about this with uh, the son of Sayyid Mudarasi who lives in uh, New Zealand. We were talking and he said, you know, I had a very interesting dream about my deceased grandfather. You know, I saw him, he was very happy in his dream and he was eating a piece of cake. It was very vivid, so he even knew the type of cake he was eating and everything. And he said, it was very strange, you know. So he said, I called my uh, cousins in Iran and I wanted to tell them about it and ask them about it. So they asked, what type of cake was he eating? So he replied, it's such and such cake. And they said, last night we had a majlis in his honor for their late grandfather and in that majlis they served that cake. SubhanAllah. So these, it is showing that whatever they did for him, he is getting something in the akhara. So we should do these things for our loved ones who passed away. Besides our beliefs and our deeds, the thing that will help us the most in the grave and in the akhara is the love of Ahlul Bayt that we have in our hearts, our minds, our actions. Being loyal to them in this world no matter what the cost. There are a few narrations I'd like to mention because the lecture is a little bit, you know, terrifying when you read these narrations. You start to think, you know, it's very serious. What am I facing after, after I die? But there are some very good narrations that will give us some hope, inshallah. I'll mention two of them. The first one is from Rasulullah sallallahu He said, take heed, one who died having the love of the household of Muhammad has died of Shaheed. One who died with the love of Ahlul Bayt has died exonerated and forgiven from his sins. One who died with the love of Ali Muhammad has died as having repented. One who died with the love of Ali Muhammad has died as a mu'min, having a complete faith. Beware, one who died along with the love of the children of the Prophet. Firstly, the angel of death has given him the glad tidings of Jannah. Thereafter, the two angels, one car and Nikir, they will welcome them. One who died loving Ali Muhammad has been sent to paradise like the bride is sent to the house of the groom. SubhanAllah. The rewards for loving Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. The last narration I'll mention is from Abi Basir that he said to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. He said, may I be sacrificed for you, Ya Imam, does a believer hate his death? Does he hate the time of his death? Imam said, Wallahi, no, at the time of his death, Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, they will come. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima Tazakra, Hassan and Hussein, and all of the remaining Imams, they will come. Then the four angels, Jibra'il, Mika'il, Israfil, and Israel, they will approach him. Imam Ali alayhi salam will say, Ya Rasulullah, verily this person was one who loved us and he submitted to our walaya, so please love him too. Then Rasulullah will say to Jibra'il, verily this person, he loved Ali and his family, so also love him. Then Jibra'il said the same thing to all of those other angels who were there. They said, Verily, this one was one who loved Muhammad and his family and submitted to the walayat of Ali ibn Abi Talib, so be kind to him. That's what they tell the angel of death. Angel of death, Malakum Maut. 
He says, by the one who chose and honored Muhammad with prophethood, I will be more kind to this person than a kind father is to his child. More compassionate to him than his brother is compassionate towards him. Then the angel of death, he stood up and he said to the person who was dying, he said, O servant of Allah, have you freed yourself from hellfire? The guy, he answers, he said, confidently, he says, yes, I have. So the angel of death, he asked him, how did you do this? The person replied, by the love of Muhammad and his family and by the walayat of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Muhammad Muhammad, MashaAllah. The death tells him, whatever you were fearing, Allah has saved you from it. Whatever you hope for, Allah has given it to you. Open your eyes and look at what you have in the hereafter. He will open his eyes and then at that moment he will be able to, he will be able to see all of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam who were there with him. And he will see a gate of Jannah open for him. The angel of death says, this is what Allah has promised you. These are your friends. Would you like to go to heaven with them, to Jannah, or would you like to return back to the dunya? The person will say, I have no need for dunya anymore, and I don't even want to return to it when he sees all of the tawab that is waiting for him. A caller from the Arsh will call, O soul that has confidence in Muhammad, his successor Ali, and the Imams after him, return back to your Lord, pleased, while you are satisfied with the guardianship, the walayat of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, and you are pleased with his rewards, with the rewards. Then enter among my servants, Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, and enter to Jannah without any fears or worries. SubhanAllah. The love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The love of Rasulullah and Ali Muhammad So great. Loving them, knowing them, following them in our actions. This will save us in Akhirah, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of the mu'mineen and mu'minat, especially those five we saw that last night they were gunned down in Husaynia in Oman, unfortunately. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite them with Abu Abdullah ibn Husayn alayhi salam. One person who knew his purpose in life was the son of Imam Hussein Ali Akbar. He knew that he had to protect the Imam and remain steadfast on the path of Ahl al-Bayt no matter what, no matter if it cost him his own life. For what is the purpose that we have in this life if we abandon the one Allah has appointed for us to love and to follow? Can you imagine on a night like tonight, a son has come to his father to ask him permission to die? How hard it must be for a father to allow his son to go into the battlefield. Ya Hussein, what are you going to do now? How will you allow your beloved son to die in front of you? How hard it must be to face this musibah. Ali Akbar, he looked just like Rasulullah. It said when people wanted to remember the Prophet, they went and looked at the blessed face of Ali Akbar. Oh, These yeah. people didn't care anything about this. When they saw him looking like Rasulullah, it is as if they had killed Rasulullah. <coughs> Imam Hussein is helpless in this situation. His promise to Allah has to be honored. My son Ali Akbar, I give you permission. But Ali Akbar, my darling, go ask permission for your mother. Go ask permission from your Aunt Zainab. 
Ali Akbar took permission from his mother, Um Layla. Ali Akbar then went to Sayyidah Zainab. Sayyidah Zainab, tell me one thing, whose life is more important? Your Ali Akbar's or Sayyidah Fatima's son, Hussein? My son, Ali Akbar, I would sacrifice a thousand lives to save Sayyidah Zahra's son. Then, Auntie, please don't stop me. Give me permission. No one is left to save Hussein. Let me go out into the battlefield. Sayyidah Zainab said, Bismillah, go, my son, Ali Akbar, go. Ali Akbar mounted his horse. Um Layla was crying. Sayyidah Kudum was crying. Sayyidah Zainab was crying. Wa Wa Husayna. Ali Akbar rode into the battlefield. He heard the footsteps of his father was following behind him. He stopped and he looked back. What did he see? He saw Imam Hussein Abu Abdullah following him. With his hands on his back, Imam Hussein was running behind his son Ali Akbar. Father, Father, where are you going? Please go back to the tent. Uh, My son, Ali Akbar, I want to see you for as long as I can. I'll stop here, but my son promise me you will keep on looking back after every few steps. Uh, Akbar, the father, wants to see you for as long as I can. Ali Akbar reached the battlefield. The people couldn't believe their eyes. They thought the Prophet of uh, Islam had returned. Yet this didn't stop those devils from attacking him. <laughs> Ali Akbar fought in the battlefield while he was reciting, "Anna Ali ibn Al Hussein ibn Ali, Nahnuwa Bait Allahi Aula bin Nabi, Adrubku bi Sayfi Uhami an Abi, Darba Ula bin Hashmi." I am Ali, son of Hussein, son of Ali. I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, we are deserving of Rasulullah. I strike with my sword, defending my father Hussein, striking bravely like a man from Bani Hashim, the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It said that Ali Akbar killed many well-known warriors in the battlefield. Then Ali Akbar came back to his father. Father, did you see me fight? I wish my uncle Abbas were here to see me fight. Father, just a few drops of water, please. I'm dying of thirst. Al-Atash, Al-Atash. If I could just have a little water, I could finish the army of Yazid. Imam Hussein wished he could give water to his son Ali Akbar, but his mouth was drier than Akbar's. He told his son to continue in the battlefield, and soon his grandfather Rasulullah, he would give him water from the pond of Kalbar. He would never feel thirsty again. Just a few more moments, moments Akbar. <laughs> Ali Akbar returned to the battlefield. Omar ibn Sa'ad ordered his soldiers to kill Ali Akbar. While a few soldiers gathered and attacked Ali Akbar all at once, one crept up to Ali Akbar and he thrust a spear into Ali Akbar's chest. Wah Husayna! The spear penetrated the chest of Ali Akbar. The handle broke on the spear. A sharp blade is now stuck into Akbar's chest. It caused him to faint. Ali Akbar fell from his horse. He cried out, Oh Father, Assalamu Alaikum, Ya Abdullah. Ali Akbar didn't call his father to come see him. Hussein was alone. Ali Akbar didn't want to bother his father after all of the tragedies he faced. Yeah, Hussein rushed to the battlefield. My son, my son, Habibi Ali Akbar, where are you? Speak to your son, Ya Akbar, Akbar, where are you? Hussein saw his son Ali Akbar. His son was lying on the plains of Karbala with one of his hands on his chest. Ali Akbar was taking his last breath. Now Hussein, what will Hussein do now? A father facing his son dying. His 